Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday afternoon. Um, for I know a lot of people in the audience know me already, but for those of you who do not know me, my name is Haley Phillips, and I practice as a capital projects and infrastructure attorney. I am also a birth doula and the co-founder of a women's organization called the Golden Door Society. Um, but enough about me. I am very, very excited to be welcoming today Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, and also known as Betsy. Betsy is a world-renowned author, prolific landscape preservationist, epic civic activist, both like Strad, we'll talk about this, but straddling the public and private sectors. Um, she studied city planning at Yale before coming to New York City and taking an interest in Central Park, as so many of us New Yorkers do when we move here. Um, Betsy first started working in the park um, with as director of the volunteer organization Central Park Task Force. And later she served as the very first Central Park administrator and the founding president of the Central Park Conservancy. The Central Park Conservancy is a revolutionary institutional model for park management. It was pioneered by Betsy in the 1980s and it's still responsible for stewarding the park to this day, as well as providing a model and a blueprint for other park organizations around the country and around the world. Um, I consider Betsy to be of the same caliber as Robert Moses and Jane nope. Jacobs, Jane Jacobs. Um, in, in the long-term <laughs> effect that she has had on the values of New York City. So it's an understatement to say that I'm so honored to be talking to you today and to be sharing your story and your values with this group of people. Well, I'm blushing. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Haley. That was really a lovely introduction. Thank you very much for those kind words. You are every bit deserving. Um, I think that one thing that I don't think everyone is familiar with as far as Betsy's story is really just how bad the park was in the 1970s. Um, so I, I would like to just like, if you could just tell everyone a little bit about what the state of the park was when you first touched down in New York and why you felt that there was a problem that people needed to get involved in fixing. Well, the, uh, we'll talk about we're taking the not-for-profit organization back a little further. I came as a city planner uh, with my newly minted uh, degree, master's degree, and I knew that I didn't really want to work for the city planning commission. Uh, and open space planning had been my, I was interested in there was just a time of new towns being built and, and green belts and land preservation uh, in and around cities. And there was a group called the Park Association here in New York. And, you know, we need more budget for parks and, you know, less cities cutting its budget and what goes first, all that. And uh, then the dumping on the wetlands and garbage dumping sanitation. Uh, <clears throat> this was uh, what I learned. As I learned, I was a new New Yorker. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and I've gone away to college to Wellesley, and I've had the experience of being uh, <clears throat> further educated in city planning at Yale. And so uh, here I am. Uh, and also, uh, I'm of a generation too, when women, you know, you volunteer, you or join the Garden Club of America, the Junior League. I mean, this is all the, the generation, you see. And so I uh, joined something called the Park Association, which became a wonderful, wonderful um, launching for my education in being a real New Yorker. I call myself an ardently adopted New Yorker. And you can read about that in my uh, book, uh, Saving Central Park, a history and a memoir. So uh, there's not much memoir in it really, but the, uh, what, what is there is uh, the 
uh, really how I come to New York and then you can, you can hold up the forests and wetlands of New York City. And because of the going uh, with the Park Association to these outlying parts, it's five boroughs. It's the great port city, you know, the harbor, darts and river. And so I learned the uh, geophysical city. I learned the, the geology and the, the city as a whole became my home. And it is my home. It's my home for life. So uh, I still go back to Texas. I uh, didn't tell you this, but you can find this uh, uh, online. Uh, I did inherit the family ranch in the mm -hmm. Texas Hill Country and with conservation easement going forward now and all of this. Uh, but I really am the outlier. My family, my brothers call me because I, uh, and, and they're perfectly happy with this, I guess. Uh, but they lived, went to Yale, went back, mm -hmm. you know, when family Back business. to San Antonio? Oh, yeah. And, and their whole lives, the children, you know, the nieces, the nephews. All well, not around. everyone, that, not everyone found such a project as you did. Well, I found a city. I found the greatest mm -hmm. city in the world. Mm -hmm. And there are other people who will say that. And I don't know how long you've lived in New York, but I mean, I think you feel pretty, pretty rooted. I definitely feel rooted in New York. I was actually reading another one of Betsy's books that I have here, not to just take out the whole library, but this one is her most recent book. It's called Writing in the City. Uh, writing the city and it, it's a series of essays about New York and one of the lines in there was um, a normal day in New York is uh, like better than an extraordinary day anywhere else. Um, I thought I just spotted it on a bench plug. Somebody else said it. Somebody else said it. They probably stole it from your book. No, 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 no. <laughs> I stole it from the bench plug. Oh, you stole it and from the no, bench No, I, I okay. saw it and I said, oh man, I feel the same way. Well, I, I thought that was a bad what, day in the park is Better than a good day. No, just you go back and read it. It's, <laughs> on, it's on a bench plaque. There were two bench plaques. And so I started the introduction with first bench plaque. Mm -hmm. And it's a Southern woman who's, I am like that too. Uh, and, you know, some friends had given her a bench because, uh, you know, just how she felt about New York. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, that's how I feel. And then when I walked around, the great lawn and I finished my walk, I'm looking, oh, at that plant that you just quoted. Were you, um, when you first started working in the park and, go, and living in New York, um, and obviously Anna showed the pictures of the park, it was pretty derelict in many ways. Um, were you still using the park? Were people still using the park even when people have like that? People always loved Central Park. Mm -hmm. They've always loved it, even in the darkest days. So. Just to finish the little bio, I wrote the forest and wetlands after, you know, incorporating the city, you know, into my knowledge uh, of, uh, of what, it, what it was, where I'd come. And of course, what is in the middle of it? What is the great park of all? The greatest park in the whole world mm -hmm. is right there in the middle of Manhattan. And of course, you know, I went to Central Park and I campaigned, in fact, that uh, Thomas Hoving, whose name may be forgotten in history now, but he was the park commissioner, and later the president uh, or the director. Of was the he before, Museum. before Gordon Davis? Was he oh, before? well before. Well before. And he uh, uh, wanted to put a polo field on the Great Lawn. And then the police needed for the mounted police, the mm -hmm. stables, going to build the stables underneath the Great Lawn. and yeah. So, and then you'd have the horses and it's nice to see the horses on the bridal trail. It used to be, you don't see them on the bridal trail anymore. And that's what it was created for, but not to have a polo uh, on the you know, equestrian sports. And so the, this was defeated and it was defeated by uh, an organization like the little, little it was little uh, park association and people protesting. And then um, that uh, administration uh, was old and he was, was gone. He went to, was that to the Met. Was, what time frame was that? That is back in the 1960s. The 1960s. That's still, okay. in, the, still in the 1960s. I can't remember. I come to New York in 64. And so, you know, this, I yeah. tag up with this group in 65 and it's a small little 
you know, group of gentle folk like myself. <laughs> we, we are, um, you know, passionate about the city and the parks and, and the, you know, keeping the budget for those things that count. And the city was heading into fiscal crisis and that was Abraham yes. Beam as mm -hmm. the mayor then. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will not go down in history as a, you know, like, Fiero, uh, like a Fiorello, LaGuardia. Yeah. But um, it's, uh, yeah. So the city in the 1970s was bankrupt. Yes. The park um, in the 1960s and the 1970s had been used for a lot of public events mm -hmm. and it was there was very little management strategy. And the, to my understanding, you obviously hop in, but my understanding is that the management strategy was like, let as many people in as possible because the more people around, the less likely there would be that there would be violent crime. No, there was more violent crime. But then there was just more violent crime <laughs> and more destruction of the landscape. Mugging, they call yeah, it. Yeah, mugging, mugging. mugging. Um, but <laughs> essentially like you, where, where when you really started to work in the park, you approached it with a very clear plan forward. Um, and also, I think that there's like, when I think about your your plan and also the, the article you wrote, which you can tell them about, um, I think that it's both provided transparency to potential donors who wanted to get involved in fixing the park and it provided that central vision. You're getting ahead of me, <laughs> the story. No, <laughs> going forward, it's one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's good advice, one step at a time. One foot in front of the so, other. Yes, and then, so what happened uh, after when Beam was at the uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> mayor and the park commissioner, it was sort of a playboy, you know, given to the uh, <clears throat> campaign and this mm. was patronage, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, he uh, asked Adele Auchincloss, who is the wife of the famous writer, Louis Auchincloss, and she and I are great friends from the Park Association. And so Adele asked me to come in because uh, Brooke Astor had given some money to this little simple park task force to start the restoration of the Belvedere. You saw that mm -hmm. and the dairy yeah. and some of these. The really castle, the picture of the castle that Anna put up is the Belvedere mm -hmm. castle and it was completely slathered with graffiti. As That's saw. right. So it was, it was Brooke Astor's grant and then Iphigene Salzberger, who uh, I call her the doyenne of the New York Times, the great matriarch of the Salzberger family. And she gave wanted, you know, keeping the kids off the streets, the teenagers uh, in the summertime. So summer interns, he gave the money for that. So uh, then I was brought in to run. Adele had to leave because the uh, commissioner, the Playboy commissioner was very intemperate and said, they're not gonna stuff any more city hacks down my throat because this is a patronage sinkhole mm -hmm. for the park department. Adele left and the, Commissioners didn't get any better, but anyway, I uh, was uh, took her place in the sense that I ran the, the grants. You know, I mm -hmm. got to know uh, Brooke Astor and Jean Salzberger, and so the summer interns. Uh, I thought, well, okay. I mean, I had written. You held that yeah, up. Can you tell? Can you tell us um, a little bit about Cedric the... Longstead's New York? Yeah. Um, so in set nineteen. 19, uh, in, 19, in 1972, this is his, was his sesquicentennial, that's 75th. This very year is the bicentennial. This is his 200th birthday, is this very year. Oh, wow. And so the National Association of Olmstead Parks, which just started out as a little organization way back when I was, you know, on the board and so forth. And uh, they, they being one very terrific uh, former president of the Garden Club of America named Dee Dee, uh, <clears throat> Dee, Dee uh, <laughs> last name, it's right here, just flew out. Um, and so she has organized all over the country, their Dee Dee Petrie, 
and all over the country, there have been celebrations of Olmsted. And so Olmsted really did become the father of landscape architecture in America, but that didn't happen right away. And so what I knew was I was so interested in Olmsted. I'd written one book about the parks in New York and then here's the jewel. And I write about Frederick Law Olmsted. And I see that the park is a great work of art. I think of it as, as an art historian, I think of it as the greatest work of American art. It's also the greatest example of American democracy, both of those things. It's a public private partnership. Always remember the word public. It's a partnership with government. And so it had already started in this kind of lame, you know, little Central Park task force that but those kids in the summer, it was great. I had them dredging in the stream beds, you know, all the erosion and sliding into the, the water and the mud and uh, forming and then having uh, weeding and, and uh, some bench repair and those kinds of things. But it was obvious uh, as I walked the park, there was a, he's been gone a long time, but Bruce Kelly was a uh, just out of Columbia uh, historic preservation program. And he was working for the task force. And Bruce and I just, just as Olmsted and his partner Calvert Fox, B-A-U-X, not both as it would be in French. Uh, so we did the same thing and walked the park and walked the park and understood what they had done when they designed the winning entry in the competition for the design of Central Park. It's called the Greensward Plan. Okay. And that was 18... 1858. 1858, there was a, when the city was deciding to create the park, they bought the piece of land, it's 843 acres. That's right. And they bought it for $5 million. And a really interesting um, historical fact that Betsy's dear friend and also the official Central Park Conservancy historian recently told me um, mm -hmm. is that the land that was acquired by the city was acquired in a completely equitable way. Pull the book up and say her name. Oh yeah, okay. So we now we're now too. we're in the promotion. We have, mode. now we're, we're promoting all the books, but this is um, before Central Park, and it's, it's by Sarah Cedar Miller. Just out. Just out this spring. Um, and I had the honor through Betsy of meeting Sarah the past couple of weeks and getting to talk to her about these things. And like, I'm sure if any of you are familiar with some of the politics around Central, around Central Park or the symbolism that has come up in recent years, um, one conversation topic is always Seneca Village because Seneca Village was a black, predominantly black community um, that was in the park prior to the 18, 1850s when the city started acquiring all this land to build Central Park. Mm -hmm. And Sarah was the first ever person, like for a long time, the records were lost as to um, how the landowners were compensated for the acquisition of the land. And it was unknown whether there was um, potential racial inequities in that compensation package. And Sarah, um, by some miracle of historical research, found the documents and was able to confirm that the land was paid for by the city with no regard to race. It was about size and location. And so this is a, a big, like brand new historical discovery as of the past couple of years. And um, it's really amazing because like, as, as Betsy said, Central Park is a great democratic institution. And so knowing that it was the land for it was acquired in an equ equitable way is a really affirming piece of historical knowledge. And, and knowing how, not just that, uh, part of it, uh, but it is all the interesting facts. The Dutch, I mean, she's peeling back that oh, yeah. landscape, you know, layer by layer. And so you're really getting to the geology of the park and you're getting, you know, the, the nature of the park and then you're getting, she went to the, the records. The record, the, yeah, like the city is. records and found these dusty old books. 
um, that nobody had looked at for hundreds of years. So it's, it's very cool. She knows every, every, every inch of the park and who owned it. Yeah, definitely a, a recommendation to read Sarah's book if you're interested in what was in Central Park before the park. Um, but I'll go back to Betsy and we can talk about, um, I wanna talk about two things that you worked on. The first is that article you wrote in 1976 called 32 Ways Your Time or Money Can Rescue Central Park. Mm -hmm. Because that was pretty important. For and that's still the Central Park Task Force. And that's the Central Park Task Force. So can you talk a little bit about the reaction that that had? It was amazing, amazing. And we talked about people loving the park, even when it was nearly destroyed. The love of Central Park, people still went there. There was, you were told to stay out, don't go in at night, you know, because there was drug dealing and there was crime. But nevertheless, the park was still in the heart in every sense of New York City. So uh, <clears throat> the, um, now where was I about? The uh, 72, well, like the reaction. I did that, the reaction. The reaction to the article. And so I did that uh, and uh, the, uh, just over the transom, in the little office that I was given down, down, well, not quite in the basement, but on the bottom floor of the arsenal, the headquarters of the parks department at 64th and 5th Avenue inside the park. And anyway, uh, I knew $10,000 within one week just came in. And with it, these wonderful letters, I remember, pledging see this must have been an immigrant's child mm. i remember after mama came home from work going into the park and pledging allegiance to the flag as they lowered it though in those days you lowered the flag at night so uh, and then you know i remember pushing the twins in their baby carriage and i remember you know this and i remember and the and the money that came in you know it, it's not a huge amount it's no, it's it was twenty five thousand actually. Uh, when you, certainly, when you compare it to what's raised today, it was everything in terms of validation. Validation. The people of New York, they were the, the commission uh, that created New New York uh, Central Park uh, in nineteen fifty eight. Uh, those were citizens, and so Olmsted and Box presented the Greensward plan to this commission, the civic commission. And so we could have a, um, <clears throat> an organization that had uh, a board mm -hmm. and it would have a relationship that was with the city and is with the city. Now, I don't think I answered the rest of your question. No, well, I just wanna, I wanna say like, so, the, the follow-up to Betsy's 32 ways um, your time or money can rescue Central Park article, which was initially what like sparked the clear message that New Yorkers were willing to engage and right. donate to Central Park. Um, it's, it's very clearly laid out as far as what projects are of priority in the park mm -hmm. and how much it costs to get those projects done, which I think is a really interesting, as interesting aspect of that, of that plan is that there was so much transparency. So you're going out and you're talking to ordinary New Yorkers and soliciting them to become stakeholders in this great public institution. And you're doing it in a very concrete and tangible way. That's right. And so the next step then is that the uh, next commissioner uh, is uh, <clears throat> same as Gordon Davis. This is when mm -hmm. Ed Koch was elected mayor. And this was an important moment in the life of New York City and in my life. And Koch turned out to be just a great mayor, a mm -hmm. character sort of. You go around <laughs> saying, how am I doing? How am I doing? You know, on the street when he met people, he was, he was really something. But Gordon Davis, uh, he had... Uh, been a young man who was, you know, kind of politically involved in the election. And he was, um, uh, saw, uh, he was appointed, uh, Koch gave him 
the appointment of park commissioner. And he saw what a mess the park was in. And he saw what I call the zealous nut, you know, this person who really cared. There's a lot park and had written about the park and uh, had this little organization. And why not? Because the park, all these awful patronage jobs that, you know, there was no system and no maintenance in the park mm -hmm. to speak of. Uh, the guys didn't, you know, they clocked in, but didn't, didn't work, work very yeah. hard. So uh, I had uh, met Gordon and actually I invited him over for dinner and uh, he, uh, you know, by the time I served the dessert, uh, he said, I want you, I want to have a, and we had to invent the title administrator, what shall we call it? Because it, it hadn't existed, but somebody in charge of the park and have a person rather than just this uh, system mm -hmm. that was the maintenance and operations system that had been inherited. Which clearly wasn't working or was underfunded. It, and... it was everything, all of those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these are good guys, but they're not motivated, just put it that way. <laughs> and so then, here I am, and what do I know really about managing a park? But I am learning about fundraising, and I do know that you can't manage anything unless you have a vision, unless you have a plan. And so we also, my being administrator, allowed me to turn the little Central Park Task Force to get it into a major, not a, it wasn't immediately major, the Central Park Conservancy was born in the, uh, just uh, 40 years ago in uh, <clears throat> 1980. 1980. Yeah. yeah, you got mm -hmm. it right. 1980. Thank you. <laughs> I, I studied. A, no, I need a prompter. <laughs> and so, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it, it, it was uh, 40 years ago. And that was the organization that we built. We built the board and you have to have uh, the, first of all, the vision. And we have that, I have that. And then the board that really endorsed it and, and gave you the opportunity to really begin a fundraising more than just writing the article in New York Magazine to have start. And I had to learn about fundraising. I was already a writer, so I could write grant proposals. I could write annual reports. Uh, and uh, then I also had you know, met some prominent people by this time and was able to start fundraising. But what we really needed, and I had, because it's a landscape, and I put together a staff that had four landscape architects collaborating and we worked with outside consultants, hydrologists uh, and uh, soil scientists and ar architecture. And social and, scientists. And social, there you go. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, was what between 1982 and 1985, the result of that was the plan. And the plan was published 18, excuse me, 1987. Uh, by MIT Press. Uh, I got it. We had it in a big tabloid form, which was great because you could and still, I'm sorry, I don't have that for you here, because you can <laughs> turn it open and you can see that we did it zone by zone by zone by zone. And you have all of the different zones fitting together like a jigsaw puzzle because you had to have, when you went fundraising, you didn't do it. It wasn't a thing. Then you're not going to just say, and this fountain, and this uh, playground, and this and this. You're saying this landscape and the playground. So you're, just, you're thinking of it holistically. So you have the entrance into the park, and then there's a playground, and then, you know, over there you have a meadow, and so that's another zone, and you have the tree crew, the turf crew, of the restoration crew and you have the zone gardeners that came later, but that was really the best of, uh, you know, innovation as we move forward was to have that. But the fundraising from the beginning was a, uh, this was a catalog of gift opportunities of this plan that we mm -hmm. titled 
rebuilding, rebuilding Central Park. A management, a management, and not a master plan, a management and restoration plan because, and we wanted to put the word management first because you can't restore if you're not going to manage. Yeah, I think that's a really um, important lesson. Like as people who are thinking about wanting to contribute to society and build things, you can't just be thinking short term about, I want to build this and I'm just going to throw money at it. That's not really how it works. You need long term buy in, you need stakeholder engagement and participation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in the case of public land, you need that public private mm -hmm. relationship. Um, and I mean, I think that's really the beauty of the conservancy model, which for anyone who hasn't picked up or isn't familiar with it, the conservancy, um, it functions as a contractor of the city. They have a contract with the city to manage and operate and preserve the park. Um, so when Betsy first started the conservancy, which we were talking about this before we hopped on, um, there was no contract between the city and the conservancy. And so the relationship between um, the public private relationship was a bit ambiguous at times. And I think it was a bit more susceptible toward um, to swing as far as administrations changing um, and, and different parks commissioners being appointed as far as like what responsibilities and rights the Conservancy had. That's right. Um, I think it was 1998 I, that no. the first contract was signed? Yes, 1998. And I had stepped down. It was 20 years in all if you factor in yeah. the Central Park. You stepped down 1996. Yes. And that, that yes. was 15 years as head of the Conservancy and five years before that working in the park with the That's task force. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. And uh, <clears throat> so where are we in this tale? Of where are we in the tale? <laughs> um, I was just explaining like the, the conservancy model just generally, which is the fact that it's a public private partnership. And really what that means is that although the city parks department still has final say over what happens in the park mm -hmm. and the annual budget of the conservancy, um, really the vision, the vision. is set by the conservancy itself. And that comes out of a plan. And that comes out of the plan. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have the vision first and the plan, you know, spells out the mm -hmm. vision through a lot of research mm -hmm. and, and uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes, as I said, a, your opportunity for fundraising. It always relates back, back to, the plan. to the projects that are in the plan. And so it's not whimsical. Somebody, you know, I remember somebody wanted to I'll put an aviary in there. And then, uh, and this is uh, in the uh, very depths of the Lindsay administration, that park commissioner, Thomas Hoving, wanted to put a polo, make the Great Lawn a polo field, make it for equestrian sports. Oh my goodness, can you imagine? I mean, yes. Yeah. So that was actually, yeah. That was defeated. Well, Moses, I was just reading yesterday about well, Moses. Robert Moses did a lot in the park. In 1934. Now, you should read Bob, Robert Carroll is his name. And The Power Broker is one of the books. When you're holding out books, this is published back, way back. Uh, but it's so important and so influential. And when you read the chapter called One Year. 1934. He became park commissioner. He was uh, the Triborough Bridge Authority and mm -hmm. the highways and the parkways and Long Island, mm -hmm. all of this, bridges. Uh, so he, uh, 22 playgrounds in one year. This and, is Moses. Yes. And then little parking lots too, you know, because the car uh, had to be accommodated. And this it's Robert Moses for you. One of my favorite Moses Park stories is the 1956 story where Moses, and for those of you who are familiar with the park, Tavern on the Green is a restaurant um, located on the west side of the park, right at 66th Street. And um, there was a playground. I'm, I'm actually not so sure about the details, but there was a playground there or like an area where children would play. And Moses, um, 
the car lover that he was wanted to come in and build more parking spaces for the restaurant tavern on the green and little did he know but that was not going to go over well with the upper west side mothers and um essentially the imagery from that scandal which i just find this so great is um a bunch of upper west side moms with prams facing off bulldozers who were there to clear the land for moses's yeah, parking that's lot that's right that's right so i find that to be a really inspiring um inspiring imagery as an upper west side woman just the idea that like these moms were like no this this space is valuable to our children and to our daily that's life right. and and that was really the beginning the beginning of <clears throat> moses's of decline mm -hmm. from power. Nobody can face off against an Upper West Side woman. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> not you, not me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so essentially like the all this to say, the park has been through many different stages of its life where different things were prioritized. When Robert Moses was in charge, he um, undertook a, a wide series of capital projects that um, in, were incursions to the natural park landscape and to Olmsted's original vi vi vision for the park. Exactly. And when you came in, by contrast, of course you have to create space for public recreation and preserve the various changes that have happened to of the course. park. Of, of course, of sports and the, the fact that uh, the park is loved recreationally, that we had to blend the, the plan. You blend it in mm -hmm. with, but you don't lose sight of the fact that the park is a respite for, you know, people, they want to come in and sit on park benches and the scenery. And then people always say to me, what is your favorite place in Central Park? Well, you know, what is your favorite child? No, I have no favorite place, but my favorite my favorite thing is the circulation system. It's brilliant. You think of the sunken transverse roads that take east-west traffic across town, 65th Street, 79th, 86, 96. So there's never any traffic, cross town traffic in Central Park. There's never any motor traffic, period. Now that, and that took some doing, and that was actually, Fortunately, back in the 60s in the Lindsay administration, cutting cars out just for the weekends and then mm -hmm. a little bit more and a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of the cars on the drives. Because Moses let cars in on the drives. Oh, and, and made those little parking lots. Too. And now there are no private cars allowed no, on the drives. But there are lots of bicycles. Lots and, of bicycles. And skateboarders. And, and scooters. Yeah, and scooters. Mm -hmm. and a little more than I would like, but it's okay. Honestly, yeah. a little more than I would like too. I sometimes am standing at a crosswalk um, especially on the west side and yes. I'm kind of like oh is it safe to go there's a million bikers and they don't really like to listen to the light <laughs> yeah the me too I watch really I have to watch really closely yeah. <laughs> um yeah I definitely have a favorite part of the park it's my favorite part of the park is the ramble yes well I can actually say that too but I have to say first <laughs> it's about it's about the movement through the park and look at how you move through the ramble. That's exactly it. That's it's it. the experience of being in the ramble. And being, I, I, I call it pleasantly disoriented because mm -hmm. you sort of, well, if you know your cardinal directions, you know you're getting out over there, northwest, you know, corner, that's me. And, you uh, too. So, uh, and you know how to get home, uh, but you still, you know, have this wonderful experience of being in the woods I mean, you're really in the woods. And, you know, you see, um, it's, it's not a busy scene. It's a, just a pleasant scene of people, you know, walking with each other. Somebody's with a dog and somebody has some little kids. And, you know, but it's, it's just a wonderful sanctuary. It really is a wonderful sanctuary. And I also agree that I think my favorite, I think I love the Ramble so much because of both the way that you can circulate and walk and enjoy the landscape while also being pleasantly disoriented. Um, I I told you this story, but people are always, I, I am in Central Park almost every day and I spend a lot of time in the Ramble and people often come up to me asking for directions in the Ramble, but it's really hard to give directions out of the Ramble if you don't, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it. 
So I, I told you, I, I often am walking people out to a more like clear exit. I'm like, oh, I'll just walk you there because if I just tell you, you're just going to wander. And our thing is so nice. And usually they, they're from another country. Yes, usually they are. <laughs> and uh, and they're grateful. And it's so grateful. Nice, nice time you had to go that way anyway. It is and, so nice. And, and I don't care. I'm like, I could go this way. I could go that way. I'm just wandering in the That's ramble. All. And, and, and it, you've done a good deed for the day. And, I agree. And, and you feel yeah, re rewarded by their liking. <laughs> um, one thing I would at, like you to speak on um, is the value of beauty as a core value for the work you did in Central Park. Because one of the things that you write in your book is that your goal was to make Central Park clean, safe, and beautiful. So it wasn't enough to just make it clean and safe. Yes. Beauty as a core value. Can you talk a little sure. bit about what that means to you? Oh, I'll just talk about how, oh, I just feel, you know, some people think beauty is a sissy word and it should be, the park should be clean, safe, and green. Okay, well, no, it's, uh, and I, I forget what the mission statement is now, but people tried to really talk me down. The, the uh, logo was the Bethesda angel mm -hmm. with a uh, spread of wings. And now it's, you know, it's different, uh, but that's okay. It's a little more corporate, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's doing the job. It, <laughs> it adorns the stationery that writes the letters, that raises mm -hmm. the funds. Uh, but anyway, clean, safe, and beautiful because it is about the aesthetics of the park. And when you go in the ramble, I mean, it's an aesthetic experience, particularly this time of year. You're looking at the light shining through the leaves. In the winter, you're looking at the architecture of the trees and the branching habit of the trees. And it's just a very wonderful experience aesthetically aesthetically mm -hmm. and I, I mean I appreciate that so much as a core value I think when you think about building institutions and public infrastructure that will be valuable across generations and span through the centuries I I, I feel beauty is really important to that for long-term sustainability well now that ties in with your work mm -hmm. right as a, as a lawyer mm -hmm. and development and the right kind of development mm, is really baked into you because uh, of the way you feel about beauty yes it is and it's 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 interesting because if you're if you're thinking about solving short-term problems um obviously making things clean and safe are going to be your priorities mm -hmm. but when you really think about beauty it's much more long-term sentiment in my opinion mm -hmm. um and i do think it takes a special ability to have that perspective and commit to it because i have some quotes here actually where i was as i was doing some research i was reading some criticism mm -hmm. of the conservancy good <laughs> um some articles back they haven't been criticized in a couple decades but this, this these, some of these articles were like around the 19 late 1990s and the 2000s and um the Conservancy was working really hard to protect the grass mm -hmm. and to protect all the work that had gone into making the park beautiful again. And someone, they, people wanted to throw events in the park and they were getting really mad when the park wouldn't allow these events with hundreds of thousands of people to come into the park and stomp all over the lawn. And one thing that was said is like, we're on a slippery slope when we start saying that the rights of grass Trump the rights of people. And I think that like there was a quote from Betsy that was like, well, their great lawn is going to be no one's great lawn if hundreds of thousands of people trample all over it. And so to me, that's like that's that's why beauty is for everyone in many ways. And you have to work hard to preserve it. I don't know. I don't know that I, yeah, I did get into it in, in the book, I think. Um, and uh, my time of troubles, that was mm -hmm. in 1982. And I mentioned earlier, Central Park Task Force and Bruce Kelly mm -hmm. uh, was my you know, landscape architect friend, historic preservationist, who walked the park with me. And some of the stuff says, Beth, if we just take these, they're self-seeded cherries, and there's just so many of these cherries in the ramble. And if we just cut just a few, we'll open up the view to developing it. I said, well, that, you know, we had this is 
when I learned my big lesson. And that was, you have to have, go to the community planning board. You have to, the park has constituencies. There are bird watchers. You have to make, you know, really relationships here. Well, I wasn't so good at that in the beginning. Uh, and uh, so we did the deed uh, then overnight. It was on, in the New York Times, it was on the front page of the New York Times. And then this is really kind of gross on the program. I shouldn't say this, that, you know, graffiti piece on, well, it wasn't graffiti, it was just a, a stump. And they were, Betsy Barlow is a psycho slut. What? <laughs> they said that about you? I never That's found horrible. out what that was. That's but, horrible. <laughs> yeah. So there was name calling, and then there was just so many walks with city council members and with reporters mm -hmm. over and over to say, look, it was not you know, a crime, here is what we're thinking about, here's the restoration mm -hmm. of a park. And nobody is, of course, is fine. I mean, you know, it's yeah. the, but then the uh, editorial that had been, you know, sort of saying that I was gonna be too horticultural and all of that. And I took him, uh, Roger Stahl was his name on the New York Times editorial board and he went with me and I explained it and he got it. And he wrote another on the editorial page. And that was, really good. I don't know how many people were persuaded, but it was a big sigh of relief. I mean, me. I think people are persuaded based on the fact that long term, the park more or less still follows your vision. Right. Well, That's a pretty big accomplishment. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's Olmstead's vision. It really was. I was I was following his vision and it is a great vision. And, and let's not forget, forget Calvert Fox, who was the architect mm -hmm. who convinced Olmstead. To work on the project with him, right? That's right, to, to the mm -hmm. design competition. Yeah. And and they they walked the park and all the beautiful arches, the stone mm -hmm. arches, and look at Bethesda Terrace mm -hmm. and all of that. That's Fox. And and Olmstead is still, of course. Uh, but it, I think it's what's so beautiful is the way in which geology is used, those massive Manhattan schist outcrops. Are left mm. not everyone but many that catch your eye and that were polished by the glacier and you know you see kids climbing on them and they're smooth and they're beautiful and many others were the park was like a quarry when it was being mm -hmm. built because think of what the wall around the park is made of that's manhattan schist mm -hmm. think of the belvedere is made of Manhattan schist. Think of the, the little waterfalls, you know, that have slabs of stone that are, mm -hmm. you know, that's slabs that were blasted right out mm -hmm. of the schist in the park. So knowing, I mean, this is so brilliant how to, and so it means on the, you know, Olmsted is very proud of his management, the management skills, you mm -hmm. see, and move that slab, I'm making this up, a little further over there. They have no mechanical equipment, you know. I mean, they have winches and I guess they have yeah, and horses and carts. Mid 1800s, the, the technology for building this park was pretty rudimentary. Um, and that being said, many people don't really know this, but nothing about Central Park was natural landscape. So you're in Central Park and it looks like it's natural landscape and it really creates the feeling of being in um, a wooded area in New York, but it that is all Olmstead and Fox. Exactly, exactly. It's all man-made, which is really remarkable. Well, and the, the, the uh, cartloads, I don't, I forgot, I have the number, but I don't know, it's over 100,000 cartloads. Of from, soil, right? Of soil. From Long Island. And, and so it's, it's really a, a great, Earthwork, if you think of it as an art, like Smithson or somebody, your artist, mm -hmm. earthworks, uh, land art. And so the little dells, you know, the meadows and the way the rocks, you know, the soil comes and meets the rock. And intentional. It's intentional. It's all, it's all sculpted, as it were, out of the, the soil uh, and the Manhattan ships. So I want to ask, did you ever have any self-doubt that following this vision was the right path forward? I don't know self-doubt. I mean, you know, I feel, I'm sort of, I guess, righteous. I mean, I feel that I have 
this is, it, it isn't just me. I mean, it isn't about me. It's about the, all the people who have bought into mm -hmm. the vision. It's about the conservancy becoming more successful. It's about the fundraising endorsing mm -hmm. the fact that this is, you know, what the park should be. And so that's- And it's, it's paid off. Yeah, and it was it was thrilling, it, and uh, so I I never lost heart. <laughs> I really didn't. I just just it, it is. We started off this conversation with one step at a time, and you just kept walking. Um, the Gellibeck Trail. No, that's the, the Wizard of Oz. But it, I am no angel. I am no wizard. I am nothing but someone who felt very lucky to be a New Yorker mm -hmm. and to have this wonderful, great work of land art right there, three blocks from where I lived and to be able beyond my wildest dreams, way beyond my wildest dreams to find the, um, find the skills in myself. That was a really wild dream, but also the, the people who've given their whole professional lives the simple part mm -hmm. and have stayed for many, many years. Some are retired. Now I can give you names and, you know, it's a great alumni association mm -hmm. of, of the people that have worked and the ones who work now. And you see the little carts going around and we had, we didn't have zone gardeners. Think of the volunteers. What is the most precious thing, even more precious than money, giving your time and the, mm -hmm. you see them and they're doing some weeding with his own gardeners. And I mean, the whole thing is really just, it's no longer love to death like it was in the beginning, but it was loved back into life. And that's how people are caring for it now. Definitely. I, um, I noticed when I walked around the park with Sarah Cedar Miller, who is, as I mentioned before, the official Central Park historian, um, everyone working in the park knew her. Oh, yes. And, and they know you as they know you as well. And I just found that so beautiful because you have these people who are really setting the narratives and the values and the mission statement of this great public institution. But then it, it seems from an outsider's perspective that there's a, so much buy-in from everyone who interacts with the Conservancy. Yeah. Success breeds success. Yeah. And then this is interesting too, and, and uh, really heartwarming. The uh, time of COVID that we are, I don't know how long the era of COVID goes on, <laughs> but it's still uh, the blessing of the park to so many people. And so the Conservancy put up little uh, on the plant posts, mm -hmm. uh, quotes. And oh you, yeah, I've seen those quotes. Those have you so seen those lovely. quotes? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, the quotes are saying it all. I mean, just what you're saying, mm -hmm. how much the park means, means. to them. Like what, whether yeah. the quotes are from all different kinds of people, from people who work in the park, from people who visit the park, who grew up in the park. It's, it's really beautiful to see around when you're walking and just read the, the depth of appreciation and gratitude is quite astounding. Um, I definitely feel the same. I spent about, about five hours yesterday in the park, um, reading some of Betsy's books and preparing for today. Oh, so I, I just, and I, I was walking around just thinking the same, that like the depth of how thankful I feel for the work that mm -hmm. you have done and how, and everyone at the Conservancy continues to do is so great because New York would really just not be the same city without the park. You know what you're making me feel like, oh. I, I'm so gratified and I'm really so thrilled when people come and compliment me like you're just doing. And uh, you would think that every spring I went and painted every blossom mm -hmm. and every tree. And, and I, I think, no, you know, and I always have to deflect that. It is the, the people who have loved Central Park uh, and the people who've given their whole lives to staff mm -hmm. the, the field and the office and all of that, the conservancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, and that's what I, how I take those compliments, but it, but it does thrill me that people love it so much. But really, and I think that this is a really interesting point, is that I think you have this buy-in because of the public-private mm -hmm. partnership model. It is. Where you're able to have this, this private 
the Conservancy, which is a private organization, with all these people who are like really invested stakeholders. And I think maybe, and not to say that that can't happen in government um, either, but I think it as it's it's much less susceptible to the ebbs and flows of changes in our political system. Mm, the administration. The administrations, because you're not dealing with um, government appointed leadership. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I mean, you're dealing with government appointed leadership dealing all the time. All the time. That's the whole point. But you have, yeah. but you have an anchor own. in the storm. Yes. And mm -hmm. also the, the fact is, is that money really speaks. I mean, when you have a budget of $44 million a year to run this, now I call it the public institution, really. It's like the Met or mm -hmm. other public institutions. Uh, and most of that is coming from the private sector. They do now the contract that you yeah. had uh, have city it is city it's forged right into that contract mm -hmm. but still mo all of the management virtually is under the direction of the conservancy and most of the um, funding is so the next thing you're going to read and the next person you want to be speaking with maybe uh, with your <laughs> group here uh, is her name is with the book in betsy betsy smith and her strategic plan. So you want you've heard my plan, the physical part, yeah. and its restoration and and being remanaged in the right way. And you'll hear from her the her strategic plan going forward. And it's not just her plan; it's the board. The board, plan. yeah. Betsy Smith is the current CEO of the Conservancy. Yeah. Um. Okay. One of my very favorite ways that you've been described um, as far as your work in Central Park is as a little missionary holding up a candle in the darkness. <laughs> well, that was in the beginning. In sure. the beginning. Absolutely. But what I want to hear from you is what values do you think are important when you're serving, when you want to serve whatever your cause is, whatever you're trying to build, whatever your passion is, like what, what values are important to you to really like building sustainably and getting things done? Well, it's, you know, it's like anything. I mean, if it's like <clears throat> protecting wildlife, it's like, excuse me for this, I'm going to take a sip of water. There are many, <clears throat> many passions and we know right now that it's not just Central Park, it's our precious planet mm -hmm. that is imperiled and climate change is here and um, really, mm -hmm. really here. And <clears throat> it's um, other things. Uh, we're in trouble. I mean, we look at the mess we're in with politically with the Russia and mm -hmm. I'm not a pundit, the political pundit to go into that. But I mean, the, the destruction that we are wreaking upon humanity, ourselves, or our own species, and on this planet. It's, it's very depressing. But what hopefulness there is in go for it, just do it. I mean, there are things you're not going to change the world, but you are going to change something and something else. And that is really, you know, you speak in, in uh, re religious terms, you're a witness. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, you are a witness for, um, <clears throat> well, what well, we've been talking about beauty, but no, you're, you're really a, a witness for love thy neighbor, or you're a witness for, you know, whatever it is that, that you are passionate with your soul, your mm -hmm. soul is there. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that message and really like it. It's like, you can't get bogged down in all the negativity. You have to see the beauty and the abundance that's around you and then go forth and serve it in whatever way you can. So we talk about the three P's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tell we them. We forgot about the three Tell P's. them. Patience, passion, persistence. And you just never take no for an answer and you just keep going because you believe and you know it's right and that is leadership too because people fall and i'm just amazed you know who me i mean but they followed this vision 
that was <clears throat> a uh, was being a witness, a witness, a witness to beauty and to to the greatest uh, the recovery of the greatest park in the world. Amen to that. Yes. Um, I think at this point, maybe we does anyone have any questions? I uh, I don't know if anyone wants to. We have stunned them into in. silence. We stunned this. them, <laughs> or maybe we're just technologically inept. I'm not sure. Oh, I can hear someone speaking. It's Pam, your oh, aunt. Oh, oh, oh. And I want to express gratitude for giving Uncle Steve and I such a wonderful place to court. Oh, Central Park. Yeah, yeah. that's where the love happened. The sparks <laughs> happened. <laughs> we were two city college kids, and we would sit in the park for hours and hours. And it was a wonderful and important part of our lives. So I thank you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry we don't have Ted Rogers over here because I could match your story, you know, about our course. I'm so. sure you could. <laughs> I have a question as well. Hi, Daniel. Hello. So um, the central Park Conservancy, as far as I can tell, is one of the most impressive modern institutions in all of America, precisely because it's a wonderful bridge between government and the private sector. And when we talk about people who are in the government, we use the term politician. When we talk about people who are only in the private sector, maybe we say philanthropist or a private citizen. I was wondering, Betsy, if you have a word or a term that describes what you are, someone who serves as the bridge between these two worlds? Oh, well, you know, I call myself a zealous nut. I mean, you know, you just, you won't think no for an answer with three Ps and all of that. I don't know. Uh, I guess, what about the word citizen? I'm a citizen of the city of New York. And New York, I feel privileged to have been uh, there at the beginning and to have been instrumental in starting the Central Park Conservancy 40 years ago. I really like that. I like that response. I think that, um, and I think Daniel would probably agree with this given his background, that maybe there's already something inherent in just being a citizen of wherever you live that requires you to make efforts to bridge the divide between public and private. And, and I think maybe that's something that we can all think about is what more can we be doing to serve that role in our respective communities? It's not what this following Kennedy, I guess, it's not what uh, city government can do for me, it's what I can do, for, not just city government, what I can do for government. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, what other institutions in in New York or in any urban area that you see besides parks could benefit from such a partnership? From such a partnership? Of the public-private uh, partnership. You mean the other parks in New York City? I mean, there are other parks. Really, it's very interesting. I'm thrilled, uh, probably more than anything else, that it's been a role model for, I think, over 30 parks in the United States. And of course here, Riverside Park has one, the Prospect Park has the Prospect Park Alliance, and you've got, uh, you know, the uh, High Line is a public-private partnership. And, you know, we can go on. Mm -hmm. uh, and outside of New York, I think Louisville, they've created, they have an Olmstead Park system. We didn't go into Buffalo and, uh, Louisville, and uh, we didn't mention the National Association of Olmstead Parks spearheading this 200th anniversary and going in many cities and celebrating. That's the homework. Um, that's that's your homework. That's right. So, uh, do you think that the public-private model could be applied to other public goods, like non-park goods? 
Well, now let me tell you that you opened up a, that's a good question because I have a wonderful granddaughter who's in her thirties. Her name is Caroline Tobin. And now did you realize that the Department of Sanitation had a foundation? Really? I, yes. I did not know that. <laughs> yes. So she is the uh, director of development now at the uh, foundation of the Department of Sanitation. And I think it may be things about recycling. I'm not sure all of what the mission statement is of that foundation, but Caroline just loves her job. Yes, I guess that's a good example of like a big um, government department kind of creating a private arm with which private citizens can engage. That's right. Um, it, it is very interesting. I mean, I, I generally am of the mind that uh, systems work better when more people understand them and are engaged with them. That's right. And I think that's a really beautiful thing about the Conservancy and the way Central Park is managed is that because it opens up space for private citizen engagement, more private citizens actually understand how the park is run. Urban Parks Institute, we need to mention that. That is the conservancy you go up one floor. Mm -hmm. And so this is taught by the, uh, its webinars and sometimes workshops and things because people are coming. And how do they, you know, it's, it's horticulture. It's a lot of different mm -hmm. aspects of managing and fundraising and all of this. And so that that's a very important. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, and I think that model could work in other sectors of government too, because if I understood better how the garbage system works in New York City, for instance, um, I might have really good suggestions on how improvements can be made. But then if there's a way for me to both engage with the system enough to understand it, and then also communicate with the officials who are in charge, that opens up a whole possibility for innovation and progress in the city. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I'm sure Carolyn yeah. is working on projects like that all the time. She is. <laughs> This is an anecdote on the side, but, but uh, there's a guy that has worked for many years for the Department of Sanitation, and he's collected just, you know, these found objects in the dumps, and there's some beautiful, you know, you go to Dead Horse Bay out in the uh, <clears throat> Rockaways, or in the uh, Jamaica Bay, and there's some, uh, you know, these beautiful glass bottles and you see everywhere you find objects. And so it's in one of the garages, you know. And mm -hmm. So I said, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a museum and, you know, if you only find a, a building that could be repurposed. And, you know, if you like folk art, you like, mm -hmm. you know, found art. And I was telling somebody this and they said, did you know that Betsy wants to have this museum? I mean, said it in a very complimentary way yeah. for found art in Central Park. You're like, that is not what I said. <laughs> oh no, oh no, oh, no. encroachment. Hey. No encroachments. <laughs> no encroachments, so enough of that. But I do, you know, I'm obviously proud of my granddaughter and I want to go see this, Definitely. You know, the, fa the found art because I love that stuff. Definitely. That's. It's, and I mean, I, I know you, I mean, it's amazing. I, I know that someone on the call is actually at Rockaway Beach right now mm -hmm. tuning in. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like there's also the, the R.I. Oh, Rise, yes. is oh, it uh, Jane DuPont. Yeah. Uh, that's, see, she's another one that came and I. Uh, Inspired I'm a, by you. Well, I'm a delinquent board member. I'm sorry <laughs> to say, but I send her, you know, small contributions yeah. whenever I can and she is it she's done it she lives in it's called Arvern and Arvern are these little houses this is her summer place mm -hmm. she lives in I think in Brooklyn with her husband and they bought uh this so uh, you know one of these different row houses and most of them were torn down in Rockaway by the in Rockaway mm -hmm. in far Rockaway uh, by the uh, you know this is back to Moses and housing projects mm -hmm. but some were not torn down and so they have been um, fixed up renovated and Jean lives there and she's been very interested they got an old firehouse and they use that as an educational center and they work with schools they have the kids they're doing you know they know mm -hmm. doing ecology and you know they're doing beach cleanup and i don't know what at all but shoreline I mean, management shoreline yeah. management mm -hmm. there you go now just read their website 
Absolutely. Definitely. Do we have any other questions? I unfortunately can't see the chat. So if anybody has any questions that they put in the chat, feel free to, to speak up. Hi, um, it's Parker. This has been so amazing and informative and illuminating and I've learned so much. Um, it's super incredible and inspiring to hear about all the work you've done and especially the perspective that you've gained across all this time and seeing all these changes and not just witnessing them, but being so, so intimately involved um, and such a such an influential and significant presence in them is, is really incredible. Um, and I'd really love to know, you know, are there are there any specific um, learnings or takeaways across this work, spinning across this work and spinning across your, your time involved in this, um, that have been surprising to you, um, or unexpected maybe, um, that, that you'd be able to share with us. You're, you're asking me a, a, a takeaway? A, so no, a surprising or unexpected takeaways from the work that you've done. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't know how surprising, uh, I guess, you know, about how a young woman from San Antonio, Texas could come to New York, adopt it as her city, have the privilege of being able to uh, create one of the institutions of this great city, along with the Metropolitan Museum, the Metropolitan Opera, I mean, it, at the um, City College, it is an institution. And uh, it is uh, part of city government and, and definitely part of the citizenry of New York. And that I was able to have this as my, I guess, the main part. I've had more chapters of my career. Uh, you've seen my books and <laughs> so forth. But really, this is the central chapter of my career is Central Park. I think that that's, a, yeah. that's, that's a really lovely, lovely value. New York is such a welcoming city. Um, obviously, we have Lady Liberty in our harbor. Yes, that's right. That's and a good point. She's a, she welcomes in immigrants and strangers. I know. Um, for those of you on the call who are part of the Golden Door Society, we are inspired by Emma Lazarus's poem and, yes, we are. and the, the ethos of hospitality, mm -hmm. of being optimistic, about, of coming here and really um, owning it and building, which is exactly what you did with Central Park, is so inspiring, I think, for everyone on this call, certainly for me. So Well, you're inspiring me by your dedication and you're doing this as an international outreach. And so it's not just to the citizens of this great city or this country, uh, it's really to the people of the world. And I think I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, be on your salon, you call this your salon? Yes. Yes, yes to be a guest. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank you enough. This has been just an absolute honor. I don't know if anyone else has any final comments or questions. I might have a note actually. It's not really a question, just something that you um, got me thinking about. I'm currently in Brussels and Brussels is full of parks. I live very close to saint Contenaire, which is uh, their Jubilee um, park. Um, and every time I walk around this city, which I actually really love, um, I reflect on the fact that this is a royal city. And so the reason why we have all these parks is because they were hunting grounds and playgrounds for royals that they at some point graciously shared with the plebs, me. <laughs> um, and it's the same in London, it's the same in many, many other European capitals. Um, but America never had royalty. You have the Kardashians, but you don't have real royalty. Um, and so I think that gives you also this incredible freedom to show the way also to Europeans and to other places on the map that had a different kind of history. 
Um, and so putting such emphasis on building the people's park um, that always was such um, is incredibly inspiring. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for many of the international people in the room. Uh, so there's also this angle of uh, just showing the way. It's a very good point. And, and obviously, the, as we mentioned, the Conservancy has shown the way for parks around the world and the country to engage with their private citizens. Well, here's something final to say, though, I'm so proud of. Do you know Vaux Vicomte, which is the queen of French gardens? And it's a historic monument, park, great chateau, and a garden by Le Notre. We can go into Le Notre. You know, we've been into Olmsted, mm -hmm. but this is. I can't say more. Uh, and Andre de Vogue, it's the only really great uh, property like this great historic chateau and great, great garden uh, that uh, is uh, still in private ownership. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he came to me and they have started a Bola de Conservancy. Wow. I think maybe it's the Les Amis, the Bola de but I think it's called Conservancy too. And he is still doing a plan. They have benefits uh, that are so spectacular, I won't blab on too much, but it, Bolivicon was built by the surintendant Bouquet, who a tax collector. Hmm? And so <laughs> Louis the 14th is invited to the house warming, the chateau warming party, mm. if you will, and the gardens are opened up and Moliere's play is performed and Lully's concert and so forth. And then the fireworks go off and the king leaves and he is not happy. And Foucault is put in jail for the rest of his life. And then Louis the 14th takes uh, all of the, the team, as it were, Le Notre, LeBron and LeBeau, the architect and the interior designer and the gardener. Uh, you know, he called himself a gardener, the greatest landscape designer ever, probably. Even, well, we can't say including Olmsted, but I mean, this, this is important. And so that's where Ver Versailles comes from, right there. Oh, it's inspired by this Absolutely. Park, and this so, garden. Mm -hmm. And now this garden is using the conservancy model of yeah, governance. That's right. Very cool. And, 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 and Alexandra, who is, uh, you know, his parents are still alive, but they are, you know, the last, you know, you have a count and a countess, mm -hmm. you know, that are, you know, this is modern day aristocracy, mind you. <laughs> and so they actually still uh, have the ownership. Of course, the government has the historic preservation, you know, imprimatur, but they're raising money. I mean, really, the great dome on the uh, chateau has been restored. And now uh, they're doing the hydrology and getting the cascade, you know, to go over the, you know, balustrade, whatever, you know, and they're doing all of this. It's um, amazing. And beautiful, it, it, it allows it to stay, stay privately managed by having private stakeholders buy in. That's the right. So but they're doing this in France in the greatest, you know, French garden uh, ever designed. And they took the idea from Little Park of Swansea. Well, isn't that great? It is great. Well, that's yeah. quite a legacy. Yeah. I think we can probably uh, wrap up there. You should get Alexandra to talk. I mean, uh, that would be just, oh, no, you really amazing. should. Amazing. This is, this is a serious recommendation. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I think we are about at time. Thank you.